Good morning, everybody. We're thrilled this morning to welcome Dr. Michelle Morris, who serves as the Deputy Commissioner for the Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness, as well as the first Chief Medical Officer of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Dr. Morris is responsible for leading the agency's work in bridging public health and healthcare to reduce health inequities, guiding the department's place-based and cross-cutting health equity programs, and serving as the key liaison to clinicians and clinical leaders across the city. Dr. Morse is an internal medicine physician with her master's in public health, who works to achieve health equity through global solidarity, social medicine, anti-racism education, and activism. She serves as part-time hospitalist at Kings County Hospital, is co-founder of Equal Health, and is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. Equal Health builds critical consciousness and collective action globally in the pursuit of health equity for all. In 2015, Dr. Morse worked with several health, Equal Health partners to found the Social Medicine Consortium, which is a global coalition which uses activism and disruptive pedagogy rooted in social medicine to advance healthcare justice. She formally served as officer of Partners in Health from 2013 to 2016, and now serves on their board of directors. In 2018, Dr. Morse was awarded a Soros Equality Fellowship to launch Equal Health and the Social Medicine Consortium's global campaign against racism. From September 2019 to 2021, she served as a Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellow in Washington, D.C. Means Committee, Majority. Many of you know that I've always considered the Institute for Family Health not only as a healthcare provider, but also as a part of New York's public health system. So it gives me great honor to welcome Dr. Morse this morning. Thank you for being with us. Good morning. Thank you so much, Dr. Kalman, for the generous introduction. Um, and thanks to all of you also for the invitation uh, to join you for Grand Rounds today. It's uh, been quite a start to my time here in New York City. I moved in February of this year. Um, and I have to say the welcome has been just so generous and so wonderful. So I'm, I'm feeling right at home, even though it's only been seven months and it's certainly been a very hectic uh, seven months to say the least. Uh, so this morning, um, I believe um, Diane's gonna be sharing our slide, or I thought I'm gonna share your slides, thank you. Um, this morning, I wanna share a little bit um, about uh, kind of the connection between some of my prior work um, and uh, the work that I've been asked to do uh, as the inaugural chief medical officer here in New York City um, Health Department and also uh, as deputy, sorry, <laughs> deputy commissioner for the Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness here. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I think the future could look like um, and how we can ensure that health justice is at the center of the next era of medicine and public health um, during what uh, has been obviously a time of intense um, change, disruption, um, reckoning, um, and injustice, actually, during the COVID era. Next slide, please. Uh, I, I like to start with this quote because I'm a Philadelphian myself. I've spent um, most of my the first three decades of my life in Philadelphia. Um, and I think this quote really encapsulates a lot of how I understand uh, health inequities, um, specifically racial health inequities. Uh, the most difficult social problem in the matter of Negro health is the peculiar attitude of the nation toward the well being of the race. There have been few other cases in the history of civilized peoples where human suffering has been viewed with such peculiar indifference. Um, this was in 1899. Uh, unfortunately, 122 years later, I think we've made some progress, but certainly not enough. And COVID has made that relatively obvious, unfortunately. Next slide. So we're gonna talk about a few different things. We'll talk about COVID, not just in the US context, but globally. Um, we'll talk a little bit about critical race theory and institutional accountability for anti-racism, and then think a little bit about where we go from here, uh, which is what I titled the talk today. Next slide. I wanna start a little bit with grounding the conversation and the presentation with New York City um, Health Department's vision for health equity. 
Um, then we'll talk a little bit more about COVID and inequities, as I mentioned, institutional accountability and the future. Next slide. So the health department's values, mission, and vision are really grounded in science, equity, and compassion. Um, our mission is very simple for the New York City Health Department, protect and promote the health of all New Yorkers. Whenever you can summarize it in just a handful of words, uh, you know it's a complex thing to do, but at least it's easy to say. Um, and I will say in my first seven months here, I have pulled on every experience I've had over the past 15 years uh, in global health equity work and health justice work and health policy work. Uh, and yet the challenges are profound. Um, but I do wanna highlight just in the list of five key priorities for the health department, the bottom three are some of the areas that I specifically am focusing quite a bit on as inaugural chief medical officer and as a deputy commissioner, implementing anti-racist health practices, improving, improving public health surveillance and bridging public health and healthcare. The last one in particular uh, is a huge part of the strategy um, and accountability for me in my role as chief medical officer. Uh, and I see this presentation at Grand Rounds this morning as a part of building the relationships that are necessary for us to be successful at the health department in bridging public health and healthcare. Next slide. So specifically, uh, some of the priorities that I've set within bridging public health and healthcare, which as you can imagine, you could define in many, many, many ways. Um, but I wanna just give a specific example um, and we'll be uh, excited to partner with the Institute for Family Health in Mount Sinai on this one. But really it's looking at racism and clinical algorithms, which narrowly defined could be focused on EGFR and pulmonary function tests and you know the vaginal birth after cesarean section calculator among others, but broadly, uh, we could think about uh, addressing racism in clinical algorithms in many other contexts, particularly because in health systems, as I, I'm sure you're aware and you're a part of, um, because of quality improvement work and artificial intelligence work and the expansive reach of electronic medical records, there are far more opportunities to look at racism in clinical algorithms than just clinical calculators that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. And I am excited to um, partner with you in that and more to come in terms of inviting you um, uh, an invitation from the health department to join some of the work that we hope to do as a convener in this particular realm in the coming weeks. The second is around anti-racist health policy. And I think that part of how we are, are planning to do this work um, and how I plan to prioritize it is as you probably know, there's been a, a massive increase in locales and um, health departments across the country um, declaring racism a public health crisis. The CDC even made this declaration recently. Um, it's something that the New York City Health Department did in June of 2020. And now the question is how do we institutionalize that declaration, hold ourselves accountable and hold the city accountable to actions that relate to this uh, declaration of racism as a public health crisis. We have several ideas and again, more to come on that very soon. Um, the third area is around institutional accountability. One example would be a citywide uh, health equity dashboard. Um, it's uh, kind of uh, an idea that's definitely in discussion. You might have seen that US News and World Report recently added metrics around racial segregation um, uh, for healthcare institutions to the way that they rank hospitals, which is very intriguing. Um, and there are many other ways that we can talk about institutional accountability and actually push forward actions that ensure that that's the case. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about a project that I worked on at Brigham and Women's Hospital before coming to the health department as an example of what institutional accountability could look like. Next slide, please. Specifically though, I do wanna talk a little bit about uh, how important our vaccine work is uh, and the vaccine campaign is um, in addressing health inequities, especially racial health inequities and inequities as they relate to preferred language uh, and zip code in geographic areas. So uh, as we know, provider recommendations matter. I have to say this to you since I know many of you are providers or work with providers. Um, this is one of the key um, tools and levers we have to encourage um, vaccination amongst uh, the communities that we serve. Next slide. 
And yet we still have a long way to go. This is data as of yesterday. Um, the racial inequities in vaccination are improving, but not quickly enough. And we have a lot of work to do to make this possible. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about race explicit strategies um, both the gifts and the challenges of implementing them. But I wanna highlight this again, because I know much of the population that you serve in IFH um, is very much uh, people of color. And I know that you have seen this um, in your work on the front lines as providers. Um, and we want at the health department to support you in being able to make changes that allow for racial equity and confidence across racial uh, and ethnic groups um, in the vaccine. Um, as you know, mandates are changing the landscape and we can have a robust conversation just about that um, and the racial equity impact of mandates, uh, but not today, not enough time for that today. Um, but I do wanna highlight, and I'll mention this again throughout the presentation, um, that just yesterday, the commissioner um, for the health department announced two huge initiatives that we think are gonna be helpful in achieving uh, racial equity and vaccination and just overall increasing the rates of vaccination across the whole city. The first is a payment policy that is going to um, essentially uh, reimburse primary care providers in Medicaid and Medicare Advantage plans um, to do proactive outreach to their patients about um, the vaccine. And then the second is a commissioner's advisory, really um, requiring and asking and encouraging all providers to integrate um, a strong recommendation about the vaccine into every encounter. And this is a part of our Use Every Opportunity campaign. Next slide. So specifically the Use Every Opportunity campaign that I just mentioned, um, it's a tool, uh, and I, I believe we can share these slides with you all afterwards, um, but this, this is a tool that we created uh, back in May and have partnered uh, with several other institutions, including Greater New York Health Association to really disseminate this tool. It has six main domains, but is very much about how um, healthcare institutions and clinics can make COVID vaccination a part of the routine workflows of your clinics and practices uh, and hospitals in order to make sure that patients are getting a positive message and a strong recommendation about getting vaccinated at every encounter. And as I mentioned, the commissioner's advisory that was released yesterday is a huge part of this campaign. Next slide. So let's talk a little more about COVID and inequity. Next slide. Um, it's important to recognize, and we don't always do this, um, that we are a part of a much larger scene um, when it comes to the pandemic. And sometimes I think it's easy to get, yeah, you know, either New York City, New York State, or United States tunnel vision about uh, this pandemic, and we can't allow ourselves to do that. Um, it would be um, a historic and incomplete. Uh, and frankly, um, unjust for us to think of this only as a, a New York City or a United States problem. Um, these hotspots are constantly shifting. Um, and yet uh, what we know is that we're never gonna be able to get to um, you know, a, a, a more um, just version um, of uh, dealing with the pandemic unless we achieve equity in access to the vaccine globally. Next slide. Um, and speaking of which, the United States purchased at least 1.2 billion doses of vaccine, at least initially. I know that this is a little bit outdated at this point, but it does get to the fact that the United States has uh, initially purchased a large majority of the vaccine doses available globally. Next slide. And yet, uh, despite the fact that we have a huge achievement in that 2.5 billion doses of vaccine at least have been given. If you look to the right here, um, the, the rates of vaccination um, are really clustered in global North countries by, in many ways. Um, South Africa, obviously a country that has unfortunately suffered um, a huge, huge uh, impact from the global pandemic, uh, still has a very, very low rate of vaccination. And again, this is related to the same patterns that we saw, say, during the HIV epidemic, um, uh, pandemic, the HIV um, era in particular, where uh, access to HIV drugs was very much patterned um, by global North, global South dynamics for many of the same reasons that we're seeing today. Next slide. 
So it's not that the U.S. has done nothing in this realm. Um, there have been commitments, of course, um, to several hundred million doses of the vaccine um, being distributed to countries in the global south in particular. Um, the United States at least committed to 200 million doses in 2021 and another 300 million in 2022, um, but this is still not fast enough. Next slide. What we also know, unfortunately, is that the COVAX initiative, though, it could have been a, a great way to ensure global vaccine equity. Um, unfortunately, um, the supply of COVID vaccine um, for most of the major partners in COVAX um, have been delayed extensively for a number of reasons. Next slide. And at the same time, what we also know is that we can increase capacity globally to produce the vaccine. And there is um, you know, expansive precedent for this. And yet we haven't used this mechanism to expand global production um, of the vaccine and tech transfer as much as we could. And part of that is uh, related, of course, to the intellectual property waivers that are needed um, for um, generic vaccine production. Next slide. So along those lines um, in the New York City Health Department, despite us being a local health department, we have certainly added our voices to the global vaccine equity conversation in saying that we would like to see the federal government accelerate um, the doses of vaccine that are made available through COVAX. And we'd also like to see, of course, um, that a larger number of doses um, be available through COVAX in addition to those doses being made available more quickly. And then thirdly, that intellectual property waivers are critical to making sure that we achieve global um, control of the COVID-19 pandemic and global vaccine equity. Next slide. And we've also supported, of course, um, uh, the epidemic specifically in May in India when things were particularly challenging with the Delta variant in India. We supported um, both the donation of equipment um, as well as uh, sharing of expertise um, across countries. Next slide. But again, um, coming back home um, to New York City, we still also have work to do here um, with the pattern of vaccine uh, inequities in this country, in this city. Um, and again, are looking forward to partner, continuing to partner with you all at IFH and across Mount Sinai um, to be able to make a dent in some of these inequities. Next slide. Specifically, one of the interventions that we're supporting in the New York City Health Department um, and that my division, the Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness is leading is around uh, the Neighborhood Health Board. This is a part of the Public Health Board. Um, we recently received a $35 million grant from the CDC um, to be able to focus on reducing COVID disparities. And the goal in this program is really um, partnering with community-based organizations and granting um, significant grants to community-based organizations in the communities that have been the most impacted by COVID hospitalizations, deaths, as well as low vaccination rates. Um, and these are communities that have you know, experienced disinvestment and marginalization for decades. Um, and the idea is that this intervention is a cadre of anti-racist public health workers and programs to really address the place-based inequities that were already in existence in New York City and have been unfortunately exacerbated by COVID-19. So this is a community health worker intervention um, and we're very excited to partner with community-based organizations um, in the most impacted neighborhoods. Um, we have several goals and strategies um, but we would be very interested in continuing to, to partner again um, with healthcare delivery partners like yourself as a part of this program. Next slide. So let's move into institutional accountability. This is where I want to share a little bit of a, a case study from my prior work um, before coming to New York City that I think is quite relevant to what you're doing at IFH. Some of the work you've done in the past on healthcare segregation and currently on healthcare segregation. Um, and then again, we'll, we'll move into where we go from here. So uh, institutional accountability, next slide. So what does institutional accountability look like for segregated healthcare? Um, I know many of you have been involved in this work and the research around um, the impact of segregated healthcare on New Yorkers. Um, this is not a new problem by any means. 
Um, and as you've probably seen, the Lown Institute recently uh, put forward a couple of different hospital ranking metrics, looking at both the level of civic engagement of private nonprofit hospitals, as well as looking at segregation. Um, several New York City hospitals, and this is the yin yang of segregation, New York, several New York hospitals had incredibly high rates of integration, but incredibly high rates of segregation as well. These two things go hand in hand. And so the Lown Institute is another resource on this um, issue of segregated healthcare. Um, but this analysis specifically from just this past fall really looked at um, the rates of Black patients' use of private um, New York hospital, New York hospitals. Um, and as we know, as you've known for, for decades, again, um, the legacy of discrimination and healthcare segregation also shapes healthcare outcomes. And that's something that's been known for quite some time. The levels of bias here are many fold. Um, it can be related to uh, patient choice, lack of trust, um, treatment protocols. Um, it's also, of course, an impact of federal payment policy for healthcare and health insurance, among many, many other things. The mechanisms are um, complex, intertwined, um, and important to um, uh, distill to figure out what the targets might be for interrupting patterns of healthcare segregation. Next slide. Um, but what I find to be very helpful in understanding these mechanisms and how they work and how to interrupt them, um, of course, is, is critical race theory. Um, I'm sure many of you are using it in your work. As you see on the left-hand side, uh, Derek Bell, one of the leading thinkers um, in uh, critical race theory and who helped to found the field in the 1970s, it comes from legal studies and uh, again, really posits that racism is thoroughly embedded in society. Um, certainly that it serves the material and psychic interests of the dominant group, which is white people in the United States. Um, it also uh, really describes um, the social construction of race um, and is very much uh, upheld by interest convergence that relates directly to the second bullet um, that in fact, um, the only ways that racism has ever been interrupted at a structural level is actually when it serves the needs and interests of the dominant group, which is white people. So with that in mind, I think um, we have to think about healthcare segregation in the context of critical race theory. Um, and I think it helps us to deconstruct why healthcare segregation still exists in 2021. On the other hand, um, public health critical race praxis, which is um, a field or a theoretical framework that has been advanced by Chandra Ford and Collins Ira Ren Bua, um, critical race theory really helps to also deconstruct how public health, um, you know, really has not been aligned with critical race theory. Um, and public health critical race praxis helps us to understand that science is not objective. Um, in fact, um, the work that many uh, of us have been doing around ending racism and clinical algorithms gets into this point very, very clearly. Some people who don't understand critical race theory would say, well, you know, race correction for calculating kidney function is scientific, it's evidence-based, it is objective, and yet what those folks have failed to understand is that race, of course, is socially and politically constructed. And therefore, um, any scientific um, uh, algorithm that uses race in a way that imputes race as a biolog biological categorization is inherently not um, aligned with critical race theory and is inherently, um, you know, needs to be further interrogated uh, because it's actually solidifying race as a biological variable rather than a social and political variable. The second piece here in public health critical race praxis is how do we generate knowledge from outside the core knowledge base? And the reason for this is because the core knowledge base in public health and certainly in medicine um, has very much been shaped by the fact that racism is thoroughly embedded in society. And that has shaped the very research questions that we've been asking um, in a way that fundamentally uh, is racist. Um, next slide. So with that in mind, one of the projects that I was involved in for many years um, before coming to New York City um, at my prior hospital at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, um, we started this work in 2016 um, when I was asked to chair our 
um, Health Equity Committee for the Department of Medicine at our hospital, um, we decided to focus on cardiovascular care um, as uh, an area for really diving deep into racial health inequities. Part of the reason for that is because Brigham and Women's is a cardiovascular center of excellence. It's a globally recognized um, uh, institution when it comes to cardiovascular care and advanced specialty cardiology care. And then heart failure is actually the most common diagnosis in our emergency department at Brigham and Women's Hospital. So focusing on heart failure for us was a natural area to dig into for uncovering um, and holding ourselves accountable, right? Institutional accountability for racial equity in our care. And so what we looked at um, was the fact that um, at Brigham, we found that patients, now I'm a general medicine hospitalist as Dr. Coleman mentioned. So as a hospitalist on the general medicine service, we always saw um, that the rates of cardiology follow-up for our patients on general medicine were quite low compared to the rates of cardiology clinic follow-up for patients on the cardiology service. Um, I should note that the cardiology service at Brigham Women's Hospital is in a beautiful new building that was just opened in 2009, 2008, and that that building also has only private room, all private rooms, as opposed to my service, the general medicine service, of course, um, which uh, is not quite as luxurious. Um, we also found at our institution that there were higher rates of readmission for the general medicine patients who um, were admitted for heart failure and higher 30-day readmissions for heart failure patients on the general medicine service. And again, this is primary diagnosis of heart failure coming into the emergency room, um, self-referred. Next slide. So we studied this and we looked at um, over 1800 unique patients from 2008 to 2017 who were admitted through our emergency department with the primary diagnosis of heart failure. And what we found over that almost 10 uh, year um, time period looking at this um, was that actually um, Black and Latinx patients were systematically less likely to be admitted to the general, excuse me, to the cardiology service, <laughs> excuse me, as compared um, to white patients. Um, and that to us, of course, is an example of institutional racism in heart failure care. And what we wanted to understand was, well, what drives this? Why are Black and Latinx patients more likely to be admitted to the general medicine service? And we tried to look at a number of things. We looked at, well, um, you know, insurance status. We looked at comorbidities, right, with the thought that maybe the patients with heart failure um, on the general medicine service had many other active comorbidities. Uh, we looked at a number of things um, and none of those accounted for this racialized pattern in admission um, for heart failure. Um, and I should also say that in addition, we, um, I didn't talk about intersectionality as one of the key tenets of critical race theory, but intersectionality is central. Um, and in this analysis, we also found intersectional inequities. We found that people over the age of 75 were also less likely to be admitted to the cardiology service. We also found that women were less likely to be admitted to cardiology. So we found these intersecting inequities as well in this analysis. Um, next slide. And we found, of course, that there were vicious cycles of uh, compounding inequities, that if you were admitted to the general medicine service with heart failure, then you were also, of course, more likely to have to be readmitted um, and be readmitted to general medicine and less likely to have cardiology follow-up. Next slide. One of the other things that we tried to do was actually understand um, the mechanism by which this triage um, was happening. Um, and again, what the pattern of, um, you know, Black and Latinx patients being admitted disproportionately to general medicine instead of cardiology, where was it coming from? Um, we weren't able to complete this study in its full um, glory because the COVID pandemic hit in the middle of us conducting this survey. Uh, but what we decided to do was survey um, the doctors in the emergency department who were responsible for triage of patients 
uh, coming into the emergency department with heart failure. And what we found um, was that there was a trend um, that hadn't really been uncovered in many other places, but there was a trend that uh, the doctors in the emergency department said that white patients were more likely to advocate for themselves to go to the cardiology service and that that influenced their decision on how patients were triaged. Um, and so again, that's a really important mechanism that we see as a part of this particular um, mechanism uh, and trend um, of, heart, of Black and Latinx patients um, not being admitted to the cardiology service. Next slide. So um, me, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, there are all these alerts going off. Um, so I worked with our department chair um, to, in the Department of Medicine to try to describe this work. Um, and how the Black Lives Matter movement really created a window um, for important um, infrastructure um, and consciousness raising changes at um, Brigham and Women's Hospital. And this article really described both kind of how that window of opportunity for change was created and how we tried to um, really use it uh, in the Department of Medicine to be specific um, about the ways that racism has shaped how we provide healthcare at Brigham and Women's. And that is an admission that is really important for us to be making. Um, that is an admission that's really important for us to be making. It's also um, a, a transparent and important step along the way in institutional accountability. Um, and I hope that um, other institutions um, have been able to make this kind of an admission, right? An honest and transparent admission about institutional racism and specifically like the examples of it at those institute at each institution. For us, it was really, really important that we reckon with the fact that this example of heart failure care is institutional racism. Just being able to name that and say that racism is happening inside our hospital, within our walls, um, is a critical, critical starting point to be able to actually advance health equity and racial equity. Next slide. Um, and I wanna go back to COVID inequities just again to make the link, right? This is, I was sharing kind of a case study and some of the work that I did prior to coming here. Um, but I think what the New York City Health Department is also trying to do is actually really be able to say, okay, for COVID inequities, um, sorry, I'm just trying to see if I can um, close the app that is causing uh, lots of noises in the background here. Sorry for that. Um, so we ourselves at the New York City Health Department have tried to be as transparent as possible with the data about racial inequities in COVID, rates of COVID, hospitalization, death, as well as vaccination. Um, because again, the work of health justice and racial justice can't start if we don't at least have that data um, and are transparent with sharing that data. Um, so as you see on the left here, um, this is a, a meaningful description um, of some of this, uh, these inequities and patterns in New York City. Um, it's also important that we show the financial impacts and the race, uh, the racialized economic um, differences across the city um, and our plan around advancing health equity um, and really being action, excuse me, oriented in the way that we are operationalizing equity in the health department. Next slide, excuse me. And again, poverty is critical to this, um, but the pattern of poverty is racialized, as you know. Um, and this is a really important piece in achieving equity, both in the COVID era and beyond the COVID era. Um, but it's not the kind of work that can happen overnight. This is, um, for better or worse, generational work um, that is critically related to both the racial wealth gap um, as well as other racial inequities. And I want to just pause for a moment here because uh, I don't have a slide on this, um, but uh, we are really looking at the racial wealth gap, I think, in ways that are, that are important. Um, and part of the work that I did prior to coming to the New York City Health Department as well was really um, looking at reparations. And this is cash reparations for Black American descendants of enslaved people 
<laughs> and part of the project projection that we did um, in that study, and maybe Uthman, if you're able to put it in the chat, that would be great. But the study really looked at what would have happened in the COVID pandemic if we had instituted reparations prior to the COVID pandemic hitting. And we compared Louisiana, um, which is a state with uh, a large black uh, population and a very high rate of inequity with South Korea, which is a country actually that has a very high rate of equity when you look at the Gini coefficient for that country. And what we showed actually was that COVID transmission would have been um, 30 to 68% lower if reparations had been instituted prior to the COVID pandemic, um, which in some cases is almost as good as a vaccine. Um, so I just wanna mention that again, because um, the work around describing the economic inequities um, and how racialized economic inequities have at their root um, the legacy of slavery in this country um, is critically important um, in how we understand how we get to a more just future um, in all of this. Next slide. I think uh, you might have skipped one. Can you go back one slide? Huh, weird. Okay, next slide is fine. Um, this just again um, highlights that same point um, around the racial inequities in health status. Next slide. And this slide, I think, really crystallizes the point I was just making um, about the need for both race explicit strategies and strategies that reckon with the legacy of slavery in this country, um, that address the impact of the legacy of slavery in this country, and um, also are directly related to how we get to a more just future in the COVID pandemic, which uh, for which there is really uh, no end in sight. So this is really, again, just looking at the trends over the past seven decades. And if you look at the black white gap um, in uh, everything from unemployment to household income, to life expectancy, um, to home ownership, um, overall, um, most of the trends are generally positive for everyone. But as you see, the gap between black and white has really not closed. Um, and in fact, if you look at home ownership rate, it's gotten worse <laughs> over time. Um, if you look at uh, life expectancy, yes, it's improved for everyone, but the gap has not uh, improved between black and white significantly. And as you probably know, the gap in life expectancy for black and white folks has diverged even further in the COVID pandemic. Just in the first six months of the COVID pandemic, you've probably seen this data there was uh, a, on average, loss of uh, life, loss of life expectancy of one year for white people, but uh, of 2.7 years for black people and 2.9 years for Latinx people. So again, COVID is setting us back in many ways, including in life expectancy, um, but the gap in black white inequities over the past several decades has not changed. That partially a result of a lack of race explicit policies a lack of reckoning with the legacy of slavery. And also it's a part of a lack of our acknowledgement that white supremacy still fundamentally shapes the structuring of our society in this country. And many of the policies that we've instituted over the past seven decades have not addressed that point. Next slide. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, I don't mean to be um, overly pessimistic, um, but let's just talk about where we do go from here. Um, and I think I'll, I just have a, a few more minutes of slides and then I think we can open it up for um, conversation. So where, where do we go from here? Uh, next slide. Um, I would say at least for the question of institutional accountability that I described over the past uh, several minutes, um, one of the things that we did uh, was actually um, describe a framework that uh, I believe will help get us to a better um, form of institutional accountability going forward. And um, Uthman, thanks for supporting me in this presentation. If you can just put um, the Boston Review article in the chat as well, um, that would be great. Um, but what me and my colleagues did after seeing these trends at Brigham um, and seeing how um, intransigent they were, how uh, persistent they were over 
um, a long period of time. Um, our feeling was that we really needed to both learn from other social scientists like uh, Sandy Darity and others who have really looked at reparations frameworks as a way to get out of uh, these you know, persistent racialized inequities. Um, and the framework that we came up with in the article that Usman uh, just put in the chat is called the Healing Arc. And again, it pulls from um, the work of Sandy Darity and many others. Um, to be clear, this is not reparations. This is more uh, applicative justice. This is more a framing of how within the healthcare sector, how can we address um, you know, these intransigent, um, institutionalized, racialized inequities. Um, and this is in, uh, I would say, additive to a need for um, uh, reparations and other uh, race explicit policies. But this is not a reparations um, program. This uh, framework is called Healing Arc. Um, it's about acknowledging, um, acknowledging the wrongs, um, redressing health inequities, and then uh, ensuring that there's closure uh, and community dialogue. So our hope and what we put forward in the Boston Review article is really that the healing arc um, should be in addition to reparations, not a replacement for reparations, and that healing arc is a, a way to uh, apply and learn from a reparations framework and apply it specifically to healthcare um, and racialized health inequities. Next slide. In addition, I think that there's tremendous work to be done going forward around uh, race, uh, racialized medicine and racism in clinical algorithms. Um, medical students, um, and I suspect some of you on the call are medical students, but medical students have really been leading the way um, in ending race correction in clinical algorithms. And I'm so thankful for their work um, because it's, uh, it's uh, unfortunately um, been, been seen as disruptive and radical and perhaps not evidence-based by some um, faculty members and leaders in academic medicine. And yet, if you understand critical race theory, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer that race uh, correction in clinical algorithms has to be changed. Um, and I'm excited to partner with, with you and other institutions across the city um, in the very near future um, to, to really uh, use the convening power of the health department to try to work across the city rather than institution by institution and really work in solidarity across institutions to end these practices and then measure the impact of it and then also support uh, patients to get into care um, who may have suffered from delayed care because of race correction. So I think that's a part of how we move forward from here as well. Um, and I should also say um, that the uh, American Society of Nephrology and the National Kidney Foundation had a task force or have been leading a task force um, on what the future of race correction in kidney care specifically should look like. And that task force just put out a press release about two weeks ago that really stated that um, race correction should no longer happen. Um, and that task force is gonna be putting out recommendations this fall on a better way to calculate kidney function that doesn't ingrain racialized health inequities in kidney care. Next slide. Um, this is my final slide. Um, I think this is a really good note to end on. And again, really um, looking forward to hearing uh, your questions and comments and reactions to um, this presentation. Um, I want to just go back to what I mentioned early on that in June 2020, the New York City Health Department declared racism a public health crisis. And um, you know, I am very committed in my work as the inaugural chief medical, medical officer and as, as deputy commissioner for um, the Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness um, to keep pushing this forward. And the health department's committed to that. Um, I think it's a really important thing to institutionalize. Um, and it's a really important movement across the country as well um, to declare racism a public health crisis. And now the question is, how do we actualize this? How do we operationalize this? Um, so I'll just close with these words from New York City's, um, the New York City Health Department's declaration uh, just about a year ago. Um, as a public health organization, we recognize that racism is a public health crisis. We know that racism is a key social determinant of health that leads to poor health outcomes and increased premature deaths. 
we are unapologetically committed to addressing racism and center our daily work in equity and justice. Um, and again, I'm, I'm committed to pushing this forward as much as I'm able um, in my work at the New York City Health Department. And again, I'm really um, interested in hearing from you all a little bit more um, about how you see this work happening at Mount Sinai and within IMH um, and how we can partner together um, uh, in pushing this work forward. So thank you again for inviting me uh, and really looking forward to the Q&A. Wow, thank you so much. That that was amazing. I, I thought I knew a lot about this subject. <laughs> Can you hear me? I'm not sure. Yeah. And um, yes, <laughs> the, this, the, the, the intellectual basis for this work um, is really astounding. And the amount of research and stuff that's going on and something that um, I think is not adequately shared. Um, you know, the, 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 even some of the references that you put are not places that people would normally see things. And, and, um, and we just have to share this literature so people can understand what a, a sound basis there is in science and, and um, to the anti-racism work, which, you know, for a lot of people is still talked about as feelings and other things, but there's so right. that the, the work that you did on just trying to unpack um, the referral patterns is something that we've been talking about um, tremendously over the last couple of months because we've recognized there are actually explicit rules about right. referrals based mm. on insurance and other things like that that are that exist that that people don't even um, mm. talk about. So I guess mm. I want to kick off with the first question, which is, you know, um, people look to our department a lot to help them. Um, in the work on looking at segregated healthcare, which is, uh, mm -hmm. a, you know, a real movement that, um, you know, I, we started at, at here at the Institute yeah. Um, yeah. Know, almost 15 years ago with our, with our uh, complaint um, to the Attorney General of New York State, and um, is now been picked up a lot um, by students and residents. And um, they keep asking, what can we do? You know, how can, what's the next step? And what, what would you say is the next step? If, if residents came to you today and said, we really want to do something in our institution, maybe even both at the Institute and at Mount Sinai, what should we be doing to sort of figure, figure this out and to understand the me mechanisms that are in place and how we could address them? Absolutely. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for, um, yeah, again, thank you for that appreciation. And I agree with you. I think we got to get some of this information out of the um, tight little academic circles and into, um, you know, more mainstream platforms. I think that that's critical. Um, but I think that that is the, the bajillion dollar question, right? I think, you know, medical students, residents, trainees always bring the most fiery analysis to this work and are often the fuel, the driver, the core. Um, and that was definitely the case for our work at Brigham and Women's. It was residents who said, hey, I only see white people on the cardiology service. I only see black and Latinx people on the general medicine service. Let's study this, right? And so those initial critical ideas um, really came from the observations of residents and trainees. And when you're trained to have that critical lens, when you, you know, read about critical race theory, when you read about the work of generations before us, looking at these trends and patterns, um, you know, you can't help but apply it to what you see in the day-to-day. -day. And medical students, residents, and other trainees see the day-to-day -day through a completely different lens than we often do as faculty members. And so I guess I would say part of the call for medical students and residents is elevating those observations, elevating them um, and saying, this is what I'm seeing. Let's either study this or let's you know, build around this or let's um, try to um, build a program, a, you know, a, a collaboration, a, um, a committee, a mechanism within the institution that is sustained, that allows for that observation to be studied rigorously um, and not as a one-off. Often what happens is, you know, trainees change, right? They graduate, they move on, but you need that institutional infrastructure to be able to take hold of an observation of inequity and then 
give it the power, the platform, the regular convening, the data, the infrastructure, again, that it needs to really uncover the mechanisms and then hold the institution accountable along the way to making the changes that go along with it. So I would say, you know, again, it's, it's continuing to find the, you know, make those observations and elevate them um, in the platforms that already exist in the institution to talk about um, and to fix and address and actualize um, those trends. So um, when it's grounded in the day-to-day -day observations, um, you just can't go wrong. And again, trainees always have those observations. I hope that helps. So. Thanks, I'm gonna turn it to Autumn to uh, moderate some questions, Autumn. Thank you, Dr. Morris. I have a hand up in the audience. Dr. Weinberg, I'm going to allow you to talk. Um, please ask your question. Dr. Weinberg, she may have raised her hand earlier. And we didn't have <laughs> in time. All right, so give me one second. I see Dr. Schiff's in a question as well. Goodness. My apologies. No, it's all good. All right. This is a, a long one. So Dr. <laughs> Schiff, thanks for this critically important presentation. Really excellent. Thank you for mentioning global vaccine inequities and IP issues. So important, the New York City Department of Health is addressing these issues. Looking internally, we have seen challenges in providing equitable access to referrals to academic medical centers, providing COVID-19 testing and COVID vaccines, currently not happening. At this point, of care and access to medical providers and staff in underserved communities. How can the New York City Department of Health support and also push community health centers to continue our work and do better? Mm, great question. Yeah, thank you for that. It's funny because some people think that we've already won the access battle, which I don't think we have. <laughs> I think we have far more access to the vaccine than we did say six months ago, um, but I don't think we can completely check that box. Um, I will say, however, like one of the um, one of the mechanisms that we can use even more, in addition to um, you know walk up appointments and things like that. Some of you, you may be aware of the in home vaccination program. Now, that's not an easy solution for everyone either. Some folks may not want someone to come to their house um, and vaccinate them, but it is another mechanism to consider um, for some patients, especially folks who are homebound. Um, so I just wanna mention that program um, as a program that could be used even more. Um, and I think is, is an important program, is underutilized, but there is no silver bullet for access. Um, that is very clear. Um, but I, I do want to mention that homebound vaccination program uh, as an opportunity. And, and Usman, if you don't mind throwing the information about that in the, in the chat, that would be great. Um, the other thing I would say for your question, uh, Eugene, I don't know if it's Dr. Schiff or not, um, it is that I think a part of what we were hoping, um, the impact of the two new policies um, that the commissioner announced yesterday will be, is uh, exactly as you say, kind of accountability um, amongst community health centers, healthcare institutions, healthcare systems, hospitals, et cetera, um, is uh, these two policies. And um, Usman, I know I'm, I'm leaning on you a lot today, but if you can put the link to the Han um, that just came out yesterday as well um, with these two new policies, that would be welcome. Um, but the two, again, the two policies are, uh, number one, that Medicaid and Medicare Advantage plans um, can now send lists of unvaccinated patients to primary care providers. And if those providers make phone calls or other outreach, live conversation essentially with um, their unvaccinated patients, they can be reimbursed for that additional effort for proactive outreach. And I think that that will help to push um, uh, providers to spend the extra time to make those phone calls, right? This is for patients who maybe don't have their hypertension control appointment or you know, maybe haven't shown up in the emergency department or the hospital. This is for proactive outreach for patients who maybe are not seen routinely in the clinic. Um, and so we're excited to support that. And then the second policy, again, is the advisory, um, the commissioner's advisory on um, uh, offering the vaccine in all visits. This builds again on the Use Every Opportunity campaign we've been doing and is very much about integrating a strong recommendation for the vaccine into every visit, every 
hospitalization, every emergency department visit, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of the idea. Um, it's still not enough. <laughs> I think it's those, these two policies are a step forward, but still not enough. And again, there's, there's no silver bullet, but hopefully that uh, is helpful. So I don't see, do you, are there, is there another question, Autumn? Oh, I was just going to say Dr. Schiller has a question. Oh, go ahead. Hey, thank you, Dr. Morse. That was excellent. We can't hear you, Red. Can you hear me? Hello? Now we can. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, thank you for the, This is really uh, exceptional. And uh, I, I guess I have two comments. One is, um, I'm really struck by the fact that, you know, students and residents are in some ways the, the passion behind a lot of this work. Um, and there has been a change in how programs are accredited and evaluated based on safety and quality. And I'm wondering if the Department of Health could take on the issue of equity and basically make academic institutions accountable for how they're training the next generation of doctors around equity. Um, and, um, it, it, you know, because it really is a great opportunity, as you point out, to connect sort of the public health system with academic medicine. And so, you know, I, I would welcome that opportunity to, to just pilot this and see if, if training institutions, because there are so many in New York City that could do that. The other thing that struck me is getting other disciplines involved. And that would be a, you know, I, I think convening an, uh, something across the city with people in sociology and anthropology um, and even, you know, other humanities and helping those of us in medicine do a much better job of connecting the dots as you've done for us this morning. So I would, I, and, and this idea of a public health system Forcing those of us on the provider side to address these issues really is a is a great opportunity. So, so thank you for such a stimulating talk. Thank you, thank you for um, those are big ideas. I love it. Uh, thank you, thank you for describing them, and 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 thanks for um, just encouraging us on this path. I think um, so. I mean, in my a lot of my former work was really in teaching social medicine and, um, you know, doing a lot of teaching and uh, I, as an assistant program director for the medicine residency at Brigham. So I am all about um, health departments being more involved in teaching health equity because it's, you know, I think the unique advantage health departments have in so many ways is its practice, right? It's practice-based teaching because of the data that we have available, because we have so many, you know, public health practitioners in the health department. Um, teaching that practice um, and teaching um, how to understand the data that goes along with that practice and the programmatic interventions that go along with that practice uh, is practice-based teaching in a way that I think is so powerful. Um, and so I love, I love that idea. I mean, again, I'm new, so I have a little energy, but, um, but I would be very interested in thinking more about what that could look like. Mm -hmm. um, and definitely am open to collaboration. Um, and sorry, the second question was more on, on the policy lines. Can you state that part one more time, Dr. Schroeder? Well, well, just the idea of bringing in other discipline, like you, you talk, talked about the fact that, um, you know, there's limited, and, and we are myopic in our view of this issue. Um, many of us just have developed bad habits over the years and bringing in other disciplines, much like, you, you know, you pointed out that the Black Lives Matter movement really yeah. help mobilize us. Um, and so when we're looking at the intellectual infrastructure of some of this, yes, the bringing in other disciplines would be an interesting opportunity. Again, totally. given the richness of the New York City educational institution. No, that's such a point well taken and totally agree. And yeah, the, the paper that I mentioned where we did the projections around the impact of reparations on COVID transmission, mm -hmm. You know, That's there were very few doctors, <laughs> very few doctors on that paper. Um, it was, it, as you said, it's really, it was really about collaborating with economists and other social scientists um, to really harness the power mm -hmm. of those disciplines. And I'd love to see more of it and, and be a, a part of more of it for sure. That's, mm -hmm. that's a huge priority for me. So thanks for elevating that. Thank you. So I, I just, I guess I'll, um, we have one minute left. I'll just ask uh, one, one last question, maybe to close, close this out. 
it, when you were describing critical race theory, you said that, um, and I think it was Du Bois that, that basically said, um, you know, that unless, it, unless the solutions were in the interests of white people, they weren't gonna happen. I think you pointed that out. So how do we get the, the segregated healthcare situation? So what, what are there pieces of that that you've been able to identify where solutions would be in the interests of white people? Because my, my, my sense is the biggest barrier is that solutions are not in the interests of white people, that white people you know, um, appreciate their privilege appreciate their ability to get into special rooms and to all of these other things and appreciate the increased access they have to the best specialists by decreasing access to, to the general public. So is there a route that you see to address some of this that, that actually could use that theory to help solve some of this? Oh, that's, that's such a question. hard question. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even have to answer it. I think it was just, it's, it's so obvious that all, that the segregation is in the interests of the very people that that continue to, yeah. to support it. No, it's so true. It's so true. I mean, I think, um, you know, God, I hope so. Derek Bell, right, is probably just turning over in his grave right now, watching how critical race theory is being attacked by the right um, and being used you know, as a tool um, to win the house in 2022 and win all kinds of other racist policies. Um, and, and so I think this is a particularly difficult time to think about interest convergence because of that, um, because the right is so emboldened right now. Um, and I myself have been subject to very um, unfortunate attacks from the right, including being, you know, our Boston Review article was covered on Tucker Carlson a few months ago. Um, so there, the backlash to this is painful, particularly right now um, in, in the moment that we're in in our country's tra trajectory. And, and so I think, I hope that in the future, we won't even need to think about interest convergence as a strategy to try to move policies forward. Um, and yet at this point in time, it's a little hard to imagine um, not needing to consider interest convergence. And so I think also, I mean, I'll just say like Mike's time on the Ways and Means Committee and what I heard in, in Washington DC to this point was that we just need to pay healthcare institutions more to take care of sicker black and brown patients. And I don't know that a payoff is the most just solution um, to this. Um, and at the same time, ultimately, um, you, you know, the pragmatists that I talk to think that that is the case. Um, I think there's also a case to be made, of course, that single payer would help with some of this. Um, but I think the racial equity and racial justice components of single payer um, continue to need to be like elucidated and strengthened. And I also think that there are very few mechanisms that I can think of that will get us to better values <laughs> when it comes to racial equity and inclusion and, and thinking beyond um, kind of, uh, you know, policies that, that make us think that, um, you know, there's only one pot of funds for things, right, to get us beyond kind of the socialized for scarcity thinking. Um, I, I, have, I think we have very few mechanisms that get us to that. But one of the mechanisms we have is social movements. And that brings us back again to the Black Lives Matter movement as a source of inspiration. Um, as a source of thinking beyond being socialized for scarcity um, and as a way of, of critical consciousness at scale um, across society in a way that very few other levers um, allow for. So um, I know we're over, but that's probably the best answer I can come up with for now. Thank you for being with us this morning. I mean, it's amazing to have you in New York. It's a privilege. Um, I hope that we use that privilege well. Um, and that we make lots of progress together. We look forward to working with you on all of your endeavors. Thank so you, thanks Collins. so much. Really appreciate it. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.